Hello, medicals. Good day to all of you. This is Dr. B.K. for you. And today, I will be discussing about one of the most important as well as an interesting topic with respect to the abdomen that is the inguinal canal. So, the inguinal canal is actually situated in the anterior abdominal wall and that region itself can be called as the inguinal region. So, it is in the lower part of the anterior abdominal wall. Now, coming to the learning objectives of today's class, so we will see the definition of the inguinal canal, then followed by the, the extent, how far the inguinal canal extends itself, exact location, then the walls or the boundaries which forms the inguinal canal, then the contents briefly about the development of the inguinal canal and finally the inguinal hernia which because of which we are actually discussing the inguinal canal inguinal hernia which takes place through the inguinal canal now what is the definition of the inguinal canal so as you are able to see here in the lower part in between the muscles something is actually traversing on and that is through the inguinal canal so it is between the muscles so it is an intermuscular passage which is oblique which is not vertical or which is not lying transversely an oblique muscular passage in the lower part of the anterior abdominal wall and what does it transmits so the spermatic cord you know what the spermatic cord contains in the last class we have discussed about the contents of the spermatic cord and more importantly it consists of vas deferens in case of males in females it transmits the round ligament of uterus okay so as compared to females the inguinal canal is more important in case of the males because in fetus the testis actually descends through the inguinal canal this passage in between the muscles of the anterior abdominal wall itself is created for the descent of testis into the scrotum. Okay. So the testis slowly starts descending from the third month of intrauterine life and slowly it reaches along the various parts of the inguinal canal and finally in the ninth month it reaches the scrotum. Okay. So that is about the testis descent. So again the descent of testis I have discussed elaborately in my external genitalia class. So, a simple definition would be an oblique musculofacial passage situated in the lower abdominal wall, anterior abdominal wall, which transmits spermatic cord in males and round ligament in females. Extent. It is just 4 centimeters in length and it is limited by two openings. So, the two ends of the inguinal canal are the two openings which is the deep inguinal ring and the superficial inguinal ring. Okay. So, the extent simply we can call it as it extends from the deep inguinal ring to the superficial inguinal ring ring 4 centimeters in length it is situated parallel to the medial 
half of the inguinal ligament okay and it is directed downwards forwards and medially okay so it just lies above also you can tell above the inguinal ligament because the inguinal ligament itself forms the floor of the inguinal canal okay so the inguinal ligament if you look it is not a transversely oriented like this from the anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle okay see the lateral part of the ligament runs downwards and medial or simply downwards then the medial part of the ligament runs downwards and medially so in between the lateral part and medial part what happens is there is a small angulation in the inguinal ligament because to the under surface of the inguinal ligament the fascia lata of the thigh which is the deep fascia of the thigh is attached to the inferior of the under surface of the inguinal ligament which exerts a pull so because of the pull you can just imagine the inguinal ligament is like a v shape okay and the lateral part is one limb of the v and the medial part is the other limb of the v and not only that the upper surface of the inguinal ligament is like gutter shape it is grooved or gutter shape which serves as the floor of the inguinal canal now the extent is from the superficial inguinal ring to the deep inguinal ring as i told you 4 cm in length lying in parallel to the medial half of the inguinal ligament coming to the boundaries of the inguinal canal so roughly you can just imagine a box like this which has got an anterior wall and a posterior wall then it has got a roof and a floor so mainly it has four walls anterior posterior walls it has got a roof and it has got a floor so through this walls or between these walls only the canal is present and which is transmitting the spermatic cord in males and round ligament of uterus in females now just let us understand the walls one by one the anterior wall you are able to see here it is mainly formed by the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle throughout its length 4 cm medial part this part it is mainly formed by the aponeurosis of external oblique muscle and of course outside to that we have the skin superficial fascia then the anterior wall laterally has got an additional support it is strengthened laterally deep to these aponeurosis you have the origin of internal oblique muscle fleshy fibers originating from the lateral one third okay so anterior wall is mainly formed by the aponeurosis of external oblique and it is actually supplemented by the internal oblique muscle on the lateral one third so this anterior wall is strengthened laterally by the fleshy fibers of the internal oblique muscle the internal oblique fibers itself they originate from the inguinal ligament lateral one third of the inguinal ligament apart from that internal oblique has got other origins intermediate segment of the ventral lip of iliac crest so that is the anterior wall for you aponeurosis of ex the external oblique and then laterally supplemented by the fleshy fibers of the internal oblique and the anterior wall has a deficiency or opening which is called as the superficial inguinal ring so the superficial inguinal ring is actually present in the anterior wall the opening we will come to it later posterior wall the next wall is actually the posterior wall so the external oblique aponeurosis 
has been removed reflected the internal oblique muscle also has been reflected deep to that transverse abdominis and deep to that what you see is the fascia transverse axis so the posterior wall is mainly formed by the fascia transverse axis throughout the whole length it is formed by the fascia transverse axis and medially it is strengthened medially the posterior wall is actually strengthened by the conjoint tendon anterior wall laterally strengthened by the internal oblique posterior wall medially strengthened by the conjoint tendon okay so you are able to see the external oblique aponeurosis has been reflected then you see the internal oblique and the transverse abdominis this is the posterior wall by the fascia transversalis posterior wall is strengthened in the front by the conjoint tendon which is the fusion of aponeurosis of the internal oblique and the transverse abdominis okay so that is the of the posterior wall okay so this is actually the course of the inguinal canal through which the content the spermatic cord is traversing or passing don't get confused with this this is actually the femoral sheath which we have discussed in the lower limb anterior wall is mainly formed by the fascia transversalis and posterior wall will be formed by the fascia iliaca so i don't want to discuss much about this here because then again you might get confused so this is the femoral sheath to which the vessels are descending this is for the lower limb here you have the opening in the aponeurosis of external oblique superficial inguinal limb through which the spermatic cord is coming you are able to see even the coverings of the spermatic cord external spermatic fascia which is a prolongation from the superficial inguinal limb that is derived from the external oblique aponeurosis cremasteric muscle and fascia derived from internal oblique and transverse abdominis internal spermatic fascia derived from the fascia transverse axis okay so posterior wall is mainly formed by the fascia transverse axis and strengthened medially by the conjoint tendon posterior wall has a opening again which is called as the d inguinal ring we'll come to it later then apart from the conjoint tendon it is also strengthened by the reflected part of inguinal ligament so the reflected part of inguinal ligament again i will just tell after a couple of slides while i discuss about the modifications of the inguinal ligament just have a note of it in one corner of your mind regarding the reflected part of the inguinal ligament so that is the structures forming the posterior wall mainly it is the fascia transversalis and i told you remember this as a opening an oval opening which is called as the deep inguinal ring roof so that fibers you are able to see the arched fibers of the internal oblique and transverse abdominis the fibers of the internal oblique and transverse abdominis they pass medially some of the fibers they arch backwards downwards forming the roof of the inguinal canal floor of the inguinal canal now the spermatic cord is not there you are able to see only the superficial inguinal ring and that is the grooved upper surface of the inguinal canal so the floor is mainly formed by the inguinal ligament which is the modification of the external oblique aponeurosis which is rolled on to itself so roof muscular arched fibers of internal oblique and transverse abdominis floor is actually formed by the grooved upper surface of the inguinal ligament floor and medially the floor is again supplemented by an expansion of this inguinal ligament so this line is the inguinal ligament expansion of the inguinal triangular expansion which is actually called as the lacunar ligament so 
if you have followed my lower lip classes and in this lapidar ligament you should have remembered in femoral hernia strangulated hernia you incise the lacunar ligament so that you push the contents upwards and there you should take care of the abnormal obturator artery which is the pubic branch of inferior epigastric artery if it is abnormally large supplementing the obturator artery you should take care not to cut or rupture the artery so flow inguinal ligament and medially the lacunar ligament Yes. Now coming to the modifications of the inguinal ligament. First of all, you know this is the inguinal ligament. You are able to see here, extending from the anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle. Mm -hmm. Then you see a triangular expansion which is called as the lacunar ligament, which extends backwards and upwards. So floor. medially will be supplemented by the lacunar ligament this is the sharp medial margin of the lacunar ligament then what happens is more further extension of the lacunar ligament into the pectin pubis is actually called as ligament of cooper or ligament of ashley cooper ligament of ashley cooper okay furthermore extension of the lacunar ligament into the pectin pubis reflected part of inguinal ligament is from the inferior crest of the superficial inguinal ring it passes upwards along the linea alba and then interlaces with the similar fibers of the opposite side okay so now you are able to see here the inguinal ligament is cut and reflected and your spermatic cord also has been retracted to see the floor structures a triangular expansion you are able to see here that is the lacunar ligament and further extension is the pectineal ligament arched fibers of the internal oblique and transverse abdominis they form the conjoint tendon on joint tendon which is actually strengthening the medial part of the posterior wall of your inguinal ligament so from the inguinal ligament this reflected part i told you from the inferior crest it passes towards the linea alba and interlaces with the fibers of the opposite side which is called as the reflected part of the inguinal ligament so that again actually strengthens your medial one fourth of your posterior wall yes now coming to the deep inguinal ring we are actually seeing their anterior abdominal wall from behind so this is skin superficial outermost layer superficial fascia external oblique internal oblique transverse abdominis and this is the fascia transversalis this is psoas major covered by psoas fascia an opening in the fascia transversalis is the deep inguinal ring which is also considered as the inlet of the canal because testis during development and descent it passes through the inlet comes out of the eyelet outlet sorry not eyelet and then settles inside the scrotum so it considered as the inlet of the canal an oval opening in the fascia transversalis 1.25 cm above the mid inguinal point okay so mid inguinal point is the mid point between the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic symphysis anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic symphysis 1.25 cm above the mid inguinal point you have an oval opening in the fascia transversalis how do you identify the opening is it is situated immediately lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels inferior epigastric artery and vein immediately lateral to it you see this opening that is the deep inguinal ring 
so when the spermatic cord passes through this it takes a prolongation of this fascia transversalis fascia as the internal spermatic fascia okay prolongation is actually called as the <coughs> internal spermatic fascia same another picture i have focused for you this is the fascia transversalis you are able to see here this is your arcuate line the recta sheet from here onwards the posterior wall is only formed by the fascia transversalis the aponeurosis of all muscles pass anteriorly so here you are able to see the deep ring immediately lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels and what is passing through the deep ring is your spermatic cord ductus deferens is shown here other contents like ilio inguinal nerve testicular artery pampiform plexus okay so an oval opening 1.25 cm above the <coughs> mid inguinal point okay so what enters through this opening is the spermatic cord that is the vas deferens along with its contents so immediately present medial to it is the inferior epigastric artery so mainly the artery serves as a guide for the surgeon to locate this deep inguinal ring and also to classify the inguinal hernia whether it is a direct or indirect bar oblique indirect or oblique hernia this roof is provided by the contraction this uh, opening is provided or actually protected by the contraction of the roof that is the arched fibers of the internal oblique so in females the opening transmits the round ligament of the uterus again you are seeing it from the beginning this is broad ligament what is attached to the upper border of the broad ligament is the round ligament passing through the deep inguinal ring and that is your inferior epigastric vessels yeah superficial inguinal ring is a opening you are able to see here in the external oblique aponeurosis a triangular gap which is bordered or bounded by the superior crust and inferior crust situated above and lateral to the pubic crust below and lateral to the pubic crust you have the saphenous opening above and lateral to the pubic crust what you see is the superficial inguinal ring the boundaries base is formed by the pubic crust and above the meeting point of the two crura intercrural fibers you are able to see the medial crura the medial crust crura is plural medial or superior crust which is attached to the pubic tubercle sorry pubic symphysis and lateral or the inferior crust is attached to the pubic tubercle from the inferior crust only the reflected part of inguinal ligament passes towards the linea alba and joints are interlaces with the fibers similar fibers of the opposite side okay that is the reflected part here you are able to see reflected ligament this expansion is the lacunar ligament this is the medial and lateral crust they are joined by the intercrural fibers helps to hold the two crust together so that the superficial inguinal ring does not become too large or dilated from the margins of this opening as the spermatic cord passes to the scrotum it takes a prolongation the external spermatic fascia which is from the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle so what passes through the superficial inguinal ring spermatic cord as i told you and ilio inguinal nerve so ilio inguinal nerve is actually not a true content of the inguinal canal it does not pass through the deep inguinal ring 
it is L1 nerve from the L1 lumbar plexus. It pierces the internal oblique muscle and seen along with the iliohypogastric nerve. Comes out of the superficial inguinal ring but does not enter the deep inguinal ring. Then it divides into many branches. It is cutaneous to the skin of the medial side of the thigh. It also gives branches to the penis as anterior scrotal nerves. Vessels, not the vessels, the anterior scrotal nerves supplying the skin of the scrotum and also the skin of the penis. Okay? Skin, mostly skin, it is cutaneous, ilioinguinal nerve. So, this opening is guarded on the posterior wall by the conjoint tendon. So, the contents of the inguinal canal in males spermatic cord in females round ligament of the uterus okay so spermatic cord in males and the round ligament of uterus in case of the females sometimes in males processes vaginalis that is the fold of peritoneum the testis carries along with it during its descent and in both sexes, ilioinguinal nerve, as I told you, not a true content, pierces the internal oblique and leaves the superficial inguinal nerve. The canal is comparatively larger in case of the males, because in females it transmits only the round ligament. Here it transmits the thick cord, ductus difference, and along with it the other constituents of the spermatic cord. Now, this inguinal canal is actually a weak area in the anterior abdominal wall because intermuscular space you are able to see here you have opening, patient you are opening and the fibers are arched here. So if there is a gap naturally what happens it is a weak area more prone for herniation of contents. Okay. So it might differ from coils of intestine to a just peritoneal fold can enter through that. So, because it is weak area, definitely what happens, nature has some defense mechanism to prevent herniation. Only thing when there is repeatedly, if that wall is disturbed during the acts, various acts of uh, chronic cough, constipation, increased intra-abdominal pressure, uh, multiple pregnancies, multi women where the abdominal wall expands during every uh, period of pregnancy. All this brings laxity to the wall and naturally weakness in the inguinal region. So the mechanisms first you can call it as flap valve mechanism. What is a flap valve? Is if you look at the superficial inguinal ring and the deep inguinal ring, both are not present opposite each other anteriorly and posteriorly. They are away from each other and obliquely placed. So, superficial ring immediately behind on the posterior wall, you don't have any opening. Deep ring immediately in the anterior wall, opposite to it in the anterior wall, you don't have any opening. So, they are actually obliquely set. They are not opposite each other. So, during increased intra-abdominal pressure, when these approximate, they close the canal and that is called as the flap valve mechanism. Okay. So, the flap valve mechanism is when these muscles they approximate, naturally the canal is closed so that none of the coils of intestine herniate through this. Even though it is coming and pushing the inter deep ring, all these structures are there to counteract. Slick valve mechanism is, as I told you, the two crura are held together by the intercrural fibers. So, this opening does not become too large or dilated or expanded during increased intra-abdominal pressure. The next is the shutter mechanism. So again, these arched fibers, what happens is during increased intra-abdominal pressure, when this contracts, these arched fibers will come down near to the floor. So, roof and floor are approximated like 
when you want to close a shop like a shutter so that is why it is actually called as the shutter valve mechanism okay the arched fibers of the roof on contraction approximate near the flow then next what you have is the cremasteric plug so that is the spermatic cord coming out you are external oblique aponeurosis is reflected you see the internal oblique aponeurosis with the arched fibers so the cremastric muscle is actually the downward displaced fibers of the internal oblique and transverse abdominals even though it is a voluntary muscle cremastric muscle on contraction what happens is it pulls the testis near to the superficial inguinal ring so that way it is plugging the superficial inguinal ring like a cremastric plug that is called as ball valve so the ball is the testis which acts like a valve and closes the superficial inguinal ring apart from that this i have already discussed opposite the deep ring anterior wall is actually strengthened by the internal oblique and posterior wall opposite the superficial ring is strengthened by the conjoint tendon Okay, so that is the defense mechanism, flap valve mechanism, slit valve mechanism, shutter mechanism, ball valve which is formed by the cremastric plug. So these are the defense mechanisms of the inguinal canal. Next, we will just try to understand what the boundaries of a triangle, the Hasselbach's triangle, medially formed by the lateral border of rectus abdominis. laterally formed by the inferior epigastric artery and the base is actually formed by the inguinal ligament okay this is the hesselbach triangle which you see on the medial part of the posterior wall of the inguinal canal now why this triangle is important is because direct hernia actually takes place through this triangle okay boundaries as i told you base inguinal ligament laterally inferior epigastric artery and medially the lateral border of rectus abdominis muscle now from the umbilicus we have seen numerous folds in anterior abdominal wall class itself median umbilical fold then you have medial umbilical fold this fold consists of the obliterated umbilical artery this fold again divides the triangle into medial and lateral inguinal fossa medial and lateral so the medial fossa medial direct inguinal hernia occurs in the lateral fossa lateral direct inguinal hernia so in medial in direct inguinal hernia it can again be divided into medial direct and lateral direct so development of the inguinal canal and in this descent of testis we have seen so that is the same mechanism here so the testis here you are able to see as it descends it is raising a fold of peritoneum and that fold which it is bringing along with it is actually called as the processus vaginalis and that is present in the testis in the form of tunica vaginalis so an inguinal fold of peritoneum around which the muscles actually develop around the inguinal fold of peritoneum okay so differentiates the anterior abdominal wall differentiates muscles of the anterior abdominal wall around this inguinal fold of peritoneum and that is how the inguinal canal is developed so prior to the passage of the testis the gubernaculum will pass through this okay so the canal is formed prior to the descent of testis so finally coming to the <coughs> applied aspects that is about the inguinal hernia so an abnormal protrusion of contents through the inguinal canal is actually called as inguinal hernia what actually protrudes it might be coils of intestine or simply an omentum omentum means a fold of peritoneum 
okay a simple fold of peritoneum to the coils of intestine so coils of intestine if it is produced it will produce a swelling or mass above and lateral to the pubic tubercle and sometimes it might get strangulated and if the blood supply is complicated then naturally that part of the intestine might also become gangrenous if it is left untreated the hernia is not repaired and that is called as herniorraphy sometimes they also place a gauze like structure and repair it so that again the herniation does not take place so basically two types herniation takes place one is the direct inguinal hernia other one is the indirect or oblique inguinal hernia so direct and indirect direct no first we will actually see the indirect or oblique inguinal hernia this is mostly congenital due to the persistence you are able to see that fold of peritoneum is completely persistent processes vaginalis here it is obliterated but here it persists and mostly you can see the herniated contents will be present inside the spermatic cord okay the herniated contents will be present inside the spermatic cord so mainly it enters through the deep inguinal ring and then comes out through the superficial inguinal ring it may be complete or incomplete incomplete means it completely traverses the inguinal canal to reach the scrotum so this the herniation you are able to see indirect inguinal canal it has all the coverings of the spermatic cord and the neck of the sac is actually present lateral to the inferior epigastric artery so that is the main point you should know it is present the neck of the hernial sac is present lateral to the inferior epigastric artery so herniation is mainly taking place through the deep ring follows the course of the inguinal canal and comes out of the superficial ring and it is present within the spermatic cord so they reach the scrotum in complete at time incomplete sometimes it may be present anywhere within the canal itself so it as i told you it has all the coverings of the spermatic cord right starting from skin then dartos muscle external spermatic fascia then you have cremastric muscle and fascia then internal spermatic extra peritoneal tissue and peritoneal sac all the coverings of the spermatic cord the hernial sac has okay that is about the indirect hernia which is mostly congenital due to persistent processes vaginalis hernial sac is lateral to the inferior epigastric artery and comes out through the deep inguinal ring it does the deep inguinal ring and comes out through the superficial inguinal ring direct when it is going to occur through the hesselbach's triangle but again i told you the direct can be divided to medial direct and lateral direct by the medial umbilical fold so the hernial sac is going to lie medial to the inferior epigastric artery here it was lateral through the deep ring now it is going to lie medial so directly it is going not passing through the deep ring so medial direct i told you a lateral direct sometimes litter's hernia is when meckel's diverticulum enters the hernial sac so meckel's diverticulum also called as the ileal diverticulum persistent part of vitello intestinal duct sometimes what happens is this if it is present and if that also herniates and that is called as the litter's hernia so a comparison you are able to see here between the direct inguinal hernia which is medial to the inferior epigastric vessels indirect which is lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels the hernial sac is within the spermatic cord hernial sac pushes the spermatic cord to one side and then 
it herniates into the scrotum. So that is the direct inguinal hernia. Directly coming approaching from the posterior wall, it is pushing all the contents. This is only indirect which passes through the deep inguinal ring. So coverings of the lateral direct, again the, con the coverings actually what happens is there is a slight variation. Posteriorly, it won't have internal spermatic fascia. First thing, skin dartos, external spermatic fascia, cremastric muscle, but no internal spermatic fascia. It is not coming through this, so no prolongation. Directly, the fascia transverse cells. So that is the point of difference between the direct and indirect. Direct it is the fascia transversalis and then extra peritoneal tissue. In case of the medial direct, so most medially again it will be coverings of medial direct, it is all the same except you will have conjoint tendon instead of chromastric muscle and fascia. Okay, instead of cremaster muscle and fascia, what you have is the conjoint tendon in direct inguinal hernia. This is mostly acquired. Direct hernias are mostly acquired type. Acquired later in life, it is not congenital. Mainly weakness due to so many conditions which I have just described a few minutes back. So thank you very much for your patient listening. We will meet again in one more lecture.